Hi there friends! I have spent the past two months cooking and baking my way through Magnolia Table Volume 2. There are some incredible recipes in this book. Some are complicated, some are very simple. My husband and six children have weighed in on each and every recipe I have made and gave their opinions. Needless to say, I think we have a pretty good idea of which recipes were hits and which were misses. So I am bringing you a review of this book today in case you would like to buy it and try some of these recipes yourself. I have photographed every single thing we made and I cannot wait to share our favorites with you. Welcome to the channel if you're new here. My name is Jen and this little corner of the internet is dedicated to living on less. And for me, that means a whole lot of from scratch home cooking for my large family. That's how we live on less. And the past couple of months, I've been doing a little experiment and cooking my way through Magnolia Table Volume 2. It's just been an incredible journey doing this, and I have previously reviewed Magnolia Table Volume 1. So I will link that video for you below and up here in case you haven't seen that and want to go ahead and watch that after this one. Before I get into my favorites and not so favorites from this recipe book, I did want to share a few observations I had. Number one, you will notice, I mean, it's a beautiful book. It is hardcover. It has a really good solid binding, so I know it's going to last a very long time. However, it is not a spiral bound cookbook, which means it does not stay open very easily. So my way to help with that is that I actually have a bamboo recipe book holder that holds the pages open and up when I am cooking. It's just off of Amazon. It's very reasonably priced. So um, I did want to mention that and I will link that below as well. But um, that's the very first thing I noticed about this book. Next observation, I'm going to let you in on a big secret here. I actually liked this recipe book better than Joanna Gaines first. I know, I mean, if you have seen her first book or tried some of the recipes from it, you might be thinking, it's hard to beat that book, Jen. Are you kidding me? The second one is better? Usually the sequel is not better, right? Usually it's not. But in this case, it really, really was. Um, I loved her first book, but her second volume, she really branches out and she says so in the foreword. And she talks about the fact that this volume was more so about getting out of your comfort zone and trying something new from different places around the world. And so what I found as I was cooking my way through this book is that I felt like our family was on a journey all over the world and there were some incredible tastes and a lot of ingredients that I'd never tried before. A lot of cooking methods I had never tried before. There were so many incredible flavors. Yeah, so a big observation was if it's possible, the second book was even better than the first. And my last observation was, I think there was a few misses with the editing in this book. There was a couple recipes where there was missing ingredients in the ingredient list and even missing steps to instructions. So one I can think of off the top of my head was the Cajun shrimp sheet pan dinner. The picture clearly showed smoked sausage of some sort laying out on the sheet pan with the dinner. And if you know Louisiana culture, you know that a sheet pan dinner does usually feature some sort of a pork or sausage in there. And um, it wasn't in the recipe at all. Like it, it wasn't in the ingredients list. It wasn't in the instructions list. So there was a bit of a miss there. And there was a few other recipes where the instructions themselves, it was almost like they skipped a few important important um, details, so it made it hard to understand. But other than that, it was a pretty easy to follow book and I didn't find too many errors. Okay, on to favorite recipes and not so favorite recipes. I thought I'd start with the recipes our family did not love so much. That if you buy this book, maybe don't try those recipes first. <laughs> um, it could just be personal preference, but I wanted to share a couple of them with you. Our first kind of miss was Lucy's peanut butter chocolate brownies. And this was the first recipe we tried from this book. The reason it was a miss for our family was that they were too sweet. We have a couple kids with sweet twos in our family, but even for them, they had trouble finishing one brownie. <laughs> and we cut them very small. So what I would say with this recipe is that you want to have really small portions or maybe cut the sugar a little bit, but um, they were just 
overwhelmingly sweet. So I don't know if that's a good thing or a bad thing if it's you. Our next miss was sweet potato casserole. Okay, my American friends, please, um, you know, I can sense your displeasure through the screen because I know so many of you are fans of sweet potato casserole, especially at Thanksgiving. In Canada, we don't tend to eat sweet potato casserole. It's not like a traditional food for very many of us. And um, I thought, I'll give it a try. It always seemed like such a weird dish to me, like mashed sweet potatoes with marshmallows on top. Very strange. <laughs> so I gave it a try, we ate it, and I will say that two or three people from our family of eight really liked it, my husband included. He loved it. He took seconds, he ate it for leftovers the next day. Um, the rest of us really didn't. To me, to be honest, sweet potato casserole I'd never had in my life, and it tasted a lot like kind of baby food with sweet marshmallows on top. Sorry to be so brutally honest, but that's kind of how I felt about sweet potato casserole. The only other recipe we tried that most of us really didn't love was the bruschetta chicken. So it looks really good in the book, the pictures look great, and it looked nice on a plate when we made it. I just found it was kind of lacking in flavor, and the recipe calls for you to top your cooked chicken breast with like the cold bruschetta or room temperature bruschetta. So you're not cooking the bruschetta on it. Then it ended up your meal kind of tasted cold or a bit room temperature. So I didn't really love that. Maybe I would like it better if it was cooked bruschetta on top, I don't know. But um, that was the only other one that kind of all of us were like, eh, we probably won't try it again. But I'm not kidding you, every single other recipe we tried, most of us liked. So that's high praise when you're dealing with a family of eight, six of them being, under the age of 18. It was so hard to narrow this down, but I really did want to share kind of our top 10 of recipes and then share my very favorite recipe from the book at the end. So stay tuned for that. You're gonna to wanna to know what the best recipe in this book is. So let's go through the other top 10 first. Number one was the pesto burrata. Wow, this was so incredible. My husband and I took a 10th anniversary trip to Greece and Italy eight years ago, and having this dish just brought me right back to that trip. It just, it's a dish that tastes like the Mediterranean. It's indulgent. It was one of those nights where I think there was a winter storm going through, so we were all gathered around the dinner table with candles and lanterns lit, just dipping in, and everybody loved it. The entire dish was, you know, completely gone by the end. I can't even tell you how delicious this was. It really, you have to try it to believe it. Number two on the list was the blueberry muffins. Okay, my mother and anyone who knows my mother knows that she makes the best blueberry muffins out there. I'm not kidding, she makes the best blueberry muffins. So for me to put these blueberry muffins in my top 10 list is pretty incredible. They're very, very good. I think what makes them so delicious is that in the batter you are using sour cream. So it just gives them such a like rich, moist flavor, but they also taste very light. Like, I don't know, they're just very, very good. And this was maybe, I think this was the second recipe I tried from the book and I still remember how good they were months later. And favorite dish number three, the white vegetable lasagna. Oh, this is so, so good. I will be making this again and again and again. It is not low in fat, but this review is not a review on calories, people. So just a review on flavors. And this one knocked it out of the park. Number four was the lemon lavender tart. Okay, so confession time. I have never ever made a homemade lemon curd before. I always just buy lemon curd from the store or if we're making like lemon meringue pie at home, I usually made the kind that is like more of a lemon jello on the bottom and that's often what you can buy in the store. However, now that I have made this recipe, this will be my new lemon pie recipe. I am telling you, I just, I mean, when I was sitting eating this, the other members of my family really liked it, but I'm a lemon girl. And as I was eating it, it was just one of those things where every bite you closed your eyes and went, oh, because it was so, so good. It had a lot of technical steps that were difficult, but it was so, so worth it. 
and the lavender, the addition of the lavender, wow. So our grocery stores here up north don't tend to have edible lavender, you know, just kicking around. So I was really glad that I had some leftover dried lavender from our herb garden from the summer. I'm a garden girl, love to garden. And um, it just gave kind of just a hint of a fragrance or something to it. It's not a flowery taste, almost just a herby taste to it. And I loved it. Number five was the Cajun shrimp sheet pan dinner. Okay, so I kind of outed this recipe earlier in the video when I talked about the fact that they somehow omitted the sausage in it, but um, I just put the sausage in because I saw it in the picture and I knew traditionally that's what goes in a Cajun sheet pan dinner. Regardless of whether there was things omitted from the recipe or not, let me tell you, oh, this was so good. This almost made it as my favorite recipe in the book. That's how good it was. Um, we were literally, you know, putting our fingers in and licking the pan when we were done. Everybody in the family loved it. The whole roasted garlic bulbs, the spices that were in it, it was just absolutely incredible. And I remember thinking when I was eating it, okay, I would really like to book a vacation to Louisiana because if this is what their cooking tastes like, I am there. <laughs> that is where I want to go next. It was just so, so delicious. We ate this in the dead of January and it made me feel like it was summertime and we were having a cookout. It just lifted our spirits. It was just such an incredible dish and a really fun one to share, to just kind of set this huge sheet pan in the middle of your table and everyone pick away at it. It was just very, very good. And number five was the Sunday pot roast. My husband made this dish completely by himself and it was actually on a Sunday so we could have our Sunday pot roast dinner. And I think the reason we liked this so much was because it calls for it to be made in a Dutch oven. And as an aside, this book uses a lot of cast iron in its cooking instructions. And normally I have all of our cast iron dishes, our Dutch oven, our frying pans, in storage for camping. I normally only ever use them when we cook over a fire. But this experience taught me how good food tastes when you cook with cast iron in your oven at home or on your stovetop. We did pizza in cast iron. We did lasagna in a Dutch oven from this book. Oh, that lasagna was incredible too. But um, I just really felt like, wow, this kind of stretched me in how I normally cook and the flavors were just so, so good. The Dutch oven pot roast, you have to cook it for four hours in this Dutch oven, but um, the flavors just meld beautifully. It was tender, it was delicious. Number seven, the flourless chocolate cake. Warning, this dish is very addictive if you are a chocolate lover. Every bite was melt in your mouth delicious. I highly recommend this dish for like a Valentine's or romantic dinner, a special occasion or a holiday maybe. It really feels like a special dessert and it was not at all hard to make. It was very easy to do. Number eight is another dessert, her key lime pie. All right, I've tried key lime pie a few times in my life and I never really cared for it. I don't know, a lot of store-bought or restaurant key lime pies have kind of a gelatinous taste to them. Um, I like lime, but it just wasn't my thing. But I thought, okay, I'm gonna give Joanna's recipe a try and see what it's like. Wow, it was so good. If you have tried her lemon pie from her first book, it's similar. And it's more of just a creamy texture instead of a jello-y texture. And it, I mean, the lime in it, it wasn't overpowering. It just, it tasted like summer in my mouth. <laughs> and I can't wait to eat it again this summer. Now on the topic of limes, you will find that in this book, Joanna uses a lot of limes. There are many recipes that call for it, her Mexican salad, her street tacos, a lot of it calls for limes. And to be truthful, in the North, I mean, I don't think we typically cook with limes that often, but this sold me on limes in cooking. I mean, it's such a simple addition. A bag of limes is so incredibly cheap and I am a cheapskate and I'm all about, you know, budget cooking. So to me, a budget addition like limes or lime juice that just takes your meal from here to here is well worth it. And she often would list the addition of limes as optional at the end. If you are trying out her recipes, do the things that she says are optional because it does make the dish so much better. So do those optional things 
you won't regret it. Number nine was the Friendsgiving casserole. This dish, you can use leftovers from Thanksgiving or Christmas, and um, it's so good. It's so comforting. It's easy to make. It was just rich, flavorful. I definitely made some homemade cranberry sauce to go with it. And I don't know, it's just, one of those homey dishes that would be really good for if you were taking a dish to someone who was maybe grieving or just had a new baby or was going through something that, you know, they need a meal thrown their way. If you send this to them, you will be friends for life with that person because it's just such a delicious meal. And number 10 was requested to be put on this list by all of my children, and that was the French onion chip dip. I have only ever like bought ready-made chip dip, or if I've made it myself at home, it was usually a pack of dehydrated onion soup mix and sour cream. Like that's what I grew up on and that's always what we made. So that's always what I made when I left the nest and was on my own. And this was, like the flavors were so addictive and so good. You're talking fried onions with garlic, you're talking herbs and spices and butter, and you're mixing it with mayonnaise and sour cream. I mean, it was really, really good. It makes an enormous batch. So I made half a batch and that was more than enough for our family of eight. So just take that into consideration if you are making it. But I mean, if you bring this dip to a party with a massive bag of kettle cooked chips, everyone's gonna love you. <laughs> it is so delicious and it tasted just as good the next day. I just put it in the fridge and it tasted just as good the next day. We used it to dip our veggies in at lunch. So um, yeah, this one, I mean, knocked it out of the park. Now, before I share with you my very favorite recipe for this book, I would love it if you would pop below and hit that like button if you were enjoying this video. It just really helps my channel out, it helps out with YouTube analytics, and it lets me know that I'm on the right track in terms of what content I'm making. So, if you don't mind hitting that like button, please do that now. All right, which dish was my very, very favorite? Drum roll, please. The Monte Cristo Sandwich. Okay, this was admittedly an unexpected front runner and definitely when I bought the book and looked through it, this was not one I thought would be my very favorite recipe. Whenever I see a Monte Cristo sandwich on like a food show or on a restaurant menu, I'm always like, that is so weird. Why would anyone like that? Meat and cheese on a sandwich that's been deep fried and then you sprinkle it with powdered sugar and you dip it in jam just really weird. It's like mixing first course and second course, I guess. And I don't always love to mix savory and sweet. And, and I mean, the picture of this in the cookbook wasn't like, it didn't look like, oh yeah, I'm gonna try this. This is the first recipe I'm gonna try. So I'm really glad that I did cook my way through this entire cookbook because it allowed me to try out recipes that otherwise didn't look that appealing because I was just forcing myself to do it. And then come to find out that Holy cow, this is so delicious. This recipe was a ton of work and my husband, I kind of did the assembling, my husband did the deep frying and I helped, and then I garnished everything up really well for the kids. And um, as we were making it, I was like, oh, this is so much effort. I mean, this is gonna taste weird. Like, why are we doing this? But you know, we were bored. <laughs> anyway, I took a bite, one bite, and I nearly fell off my chair. It was so, so good. This is what I imagine. I've never been to the Iowa State Fair before, but I imagine that this would be like the winning food truck at Iowa State Fair. Um, this would be their dish, except I made it at home in our kitchen. <laughs> um, a home cook can make this recipe. No fancy training required. Um, just the coating was so, good. It tasted like you had like a crispy cream donut surrounding a sandwich. I'm sure it was a million calories and I would never have thought that like melted meat and cheese deep fried would taste good dipped in jam or that you know that you should add powdered sugar to something like that but it was so good. So, I mean, if you have never tried a Monte Cristo sandwich, definitely try this. But even if you have tried them before, but you've never made it yourself, give it a try. It wasn't that hard. I don't even own a deep fryer. We just used a big pot of oil to do it and it worked just fine. 
So if you are buying this book, definitely try that recipe out as well as the other top 10 I mentioned. But I mean, I wish I could talk about every single recipe I made, but that video would probably have to last six hours. For the most part, they were all so delicious. So I definitely highly recommend this book. Awesome job, Joanna Gaines. Not that she's watching this video, but you really can't go wrong with this book. Even just buying it for a friend or a relative as a gift, somebody who's a foodie who loves to be in the kitchen, they would love this book. Okay guys, so what do you think? Does this book sound like one you would like to try? If so, I have it linked below in my Amazon affiliates as well as the first book. Now, if you like what you see here and you would like to join this community and learn all about kind of taking your least and making the most out of it, please join us and subscribe below. And if you would like to watch the video review I did of Magnolia Table, the first volume, I will put that right here so you can go ahead and click on it next. It was great to spend some time with you today. I hope whatever you're doing, wherever you are, you're living well. For the least, this is Jed.